Well, good morning. Welcome. So glad each and every one of you are here with us this morning. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for joining us that way as well. I hope you have your Bible with you. If you have it, turn to Psalm 51, if you would, please. Psalm 51, that's where we want to go today as we continue in this series that we're calling Refresh. And what we're doing in this series is we're just talking about this new life that we have in Christ. And we're just taking a look at some Psalms in the Old Testament that help us focus on and learn more about this new life that we have in Jesus. And today we're going to go to Psalm 51, and we're going to discover that we can be renewed and restored in our relationship with God. You know, according to the Bible, there are two ways that we can live our lives. We can either live life our way, or we can live life God's way. And living life God's way is all about Jesus. And so we're either living our way, or we're living God's way. And the Bible talks about these two different ways that we can live. Look at what John says in the New Testament, talking about Jesus. He says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So John says that in Jesus is life, and that life is the light of men. So uh, so John says there's either light or there's darkness. Light being the new life in Christ, darkness being the old life. Jesus talks about how the nations are gathered before him, and everyone's separated into two groups. You have the sheep and the goats, and the sheep are the ones who have lived this new life in Christ, and the goats who are ones who have lived the old life. Jesus goes even so far as to say that we can be on one of two roads in life, one of two paths, and these two paths lead to two very different destinations. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 7. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, I want you to notice something here just real quickly, right? Jesus doesn't talk about a middle road here, does he? I mean, Jesus says you're basically on one of two roads. You're on one of two paths. And you can't travel both roads at the same time. And so he says everyone is either on the broad road and that leads to destruction, or you're on the narrow road and that leads to life. And so you can live in the light or you can live in darkness. You can be a sheep or a goat. You can be on the broad road. You can be on the narrow road. You you can be living with authenticity, but you can also compromise. You can live in the old life outside of Christ, or you can live in the new life inside of Jesus. Now, when you live in the new life inside of Jesus, there are those moments when we get off track, right? Where maybe we're living with authenticity, but we start to compromise. Or maybe we're living the new life, but the old life starts to creep in just a little bit. Or maybe we're living in the light, but we have to fight the darkness. And so we get off track just a little bit. But the good news this morning is when we get off track, we can always come back. We can always come home. We can always be renewed. We can always be restored. And we're going to see this in Psalm 51. Now, David, the writer of this psalm, Psalm 51, he found himself at a place in life where he needed to be renewed and restored in his relationship with God. So let me kind of set up what's happening here. Uh, in Psalm 51, and then we're just going to look at three verses together this morning uh, from this psalm, all right? But if you go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, you find this battle that's taking place, and all the men are out fighting in the battle, and David stays home, and there's this evening where David goes up on the rooftop, and he's walking around, and he looks across the way, and he sees this woman bathing on her rooftop. Her name is Bathsheba. And the Bible says that Bathsheba was a very beautiful woman. And so David sends somebody over to kind of check on her. And so what starts out as maybe like a simple curiosity just turns into a big old mess before it's all over. Because David ends up sleeping with Bathsheba and she's married and she gets pregnant. And so this David decides that he's going to try to cover it up with Bathsheba's husband. And so Bathsheba's husband comes home from battle. He wants her husband to sleep with her. That doesn't work. When that doesn't work, he sends her husband back into battle and instructs that he go on the front lines of the battle so that he can be killed. And he eventually dies in battle. And so I want you to see what happens after all this. Bathsheba mourns the loss of her husband. And so I want you to see what happens after all this is over. It says, after the time of mourning was over, so after Bathsheba is done mourning the loss of her husband, After the time of mourning was over, David had her husband brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So David has displeased the Lord. And so what ends up happening is the son that Bathsheba has eventually dies. The baby dies. And before it's over, David's family just completely falls apart. 
Now, if you were here last week, you may remember we talked about how you have one small sin, what seems like one small sin that turns into a bigger sin, that turns into a bigger sin, and before you know it, you've got this huge sin that becomes like this stronghold in your life. That's where we're at with David. I mean, what started out as maybe like a, a passing fancy just kind of explodes before it's all over, right? So that's 2 Samuel chapter 11. You flip the page over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and the prophet Nathan visits David, and Nathan tells David this story about this rich man that has all the sheep and cattle that he could ever want, and this poor man who has one ewe lamb. And this one ewe lamb was like a pet to this poor man. I mean, like, like, like this ewe lamb, she just like ate the food off of his table, and she drank out of the poor man's cup. She slept in the poor man's arms. I mean, this ewe lamb has it better than our dog at our house, right? And so before the story's over, Nathan says that this ewe lamb was like a daughter to this poor man. So you get the picture, right? Like this ewe lamb means the world to this guy. Now let's go back to the rich man. Because Nathan goes on in the story, and he talks about this rich man who has all the sheep and all the cattle that he could ever want. And there's a traveler that comes and visits him. And he decides he's going to feed uh, the traveler dinner. And rather than go out and get one of the lambs from all the sheep and all the cattle that he had... He goes over and gets the ewe lamb from the poor man. He kills it, he cooks it, and he feeds it to the traveler. Not a nice thing to do at all, right? And so after Nathan tells David this story, look at what happens. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. You see, this is, da- this is Nathan's way of letting David know that he had gotten off track. This is Nathan's way of let- letting David know that he's fighting the darkness, that the old life is beginning to creep in. And ev- eventually David realizes what's going on because a few verses later, look what happens. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David realized that what started out as a sin was ruining his relationship with God and he needed to be renewed and he needed to be restored in that relationship. And so it's in light of all that that David writes Psalm 51. And so we're going to start at verse 10 and we're going to read down through verse 12. And I want you to read these words. I want you to hear these words in light of everything that's going on with David here. All right. And so Psalm 51 verse 10. Here's what David says. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So David had blown it. And he needed to be renewed and restored in his relationship with God. So what are some things that we can do when we blow it? What are some things that we can do when we blow it and we know that we need to be renewed and restored in our relationship with God. So this is what we're going to talk about this morning. We're just going to dive into Psalm 51 and talk about some of these things. So uh, there's going to be some notes on the screen behind me. If you have a pad of paper and a pen, you can jot those down. If you have the RCC app on your device, there's a place where you can uh, fill in some blanks on an outline and take some of your own notes if you'd like to do that. So what do we need to do to be renewed and restored when we've blown it? Well, first of all, I think we need to seek a cleansing. When we blow it, When we need to be renewed and restored in our relationship with God, we need to seek a cleansing. And that may sound kind of like a weird way to say this, but this is is basically what David says here in Psalm 51. Go back to verse 10. Look at what he says. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. And so David has sinned, and he's crying out to God for a clean heart. He's crying out to God for a pure heart. He's crying out to God to change his heart. He doesn't want to go back to his old sinful ways. And so he asked God for a pure heart. You see, David understands that sin is not superficial. And so this is what we have to understand, friends, this morning as we work through this, as we talk about being renewed and restored in our own relationship with God, sin is not a superficial problem. It's a heart problem. In fact, look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7. Jesus says, Out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, Malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So what Jesus is telling us here is that sin is not a superficial problem. It's a heart problem. And sin wars against our relationship with God. Paul said it like this. This is going to be a a verse that's familiar to many of us. But look what Paul says. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
And so all of us sin, and when we sin, we are simply choosing to live our own way. We're battling the darkness. We're compromising while we're trying to live with authenticity. The old life is creeping in while we're living this new life in Christ. And sin cuts us off from God. Now, we've talked about this several times uh, when we've read this verse together. But when Paul talks about sin here in this verse, he's literally talking about missing the mark. He's, he's drawing this picture that like there's this bullseye on this target. And when we sin, we miss the bullseye. So I've got a picture of this target up here. That yellow area right there, that's where God wants us to live. That's the bullseye. And when we sin, we go outside of that yellow area. We miss the bullseye. And when we're outside of that yellow area, Paul says that we don't give God the glory that he deserves because we've chosen to go our own way. And living this new life in Christ is not about going our own way at all. And so when we sin and we're outside of this yellow area, it's not a superficial problem, but rather it's a heart problem. And unless we seek a fix for this heart problem, we can't truly live this new life that God has in store for us. Look what the Hebrews writer says. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders... And the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And so, friends, this race that God has marked out for us is this new life that we have in Christ. And it's going to be difficult for us to run this race if we have a heart problem. And so we've got to seek a cleansing. I mean, the Hebrews writer says you've got to throw off the sin that so easily entangles you as you run this race. And so if you want to run this race, if you want to live this new life that God has in store for us in Christ, then we've got to be cleansed. We need a new heart. In the New Testament, John says it like this. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So if we're living this new life in Christ, if we're walking in the light, Then John says, it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses our hearts. It's the blood of Jesus that purifies our hearts. Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever played the game charades? Let me just see a show of hands. How many of you have played the game charades? This is an old game. It's been around for a long time, so probably most of us have played with it or or played it or are familiar with that game, you know, where you have these actions or these gestures that you have to act out and you try to get your team, your group to guess whatever it is that you're acting out, right? So it may be like a Maybe it's like a famous person, or maybe it's uh, like a book title, song title, music title. Maybe it's a common phrase or common saying, but you have these gestures and these actions that you act out to try to get people to guess whatever that is that that you're acting out. And if we're not careful, we can come to church and kind of play charades because we have all these actions, we do all these gestures, And we do these things, if we're not careful, we do these things to try to trick people into thinking that we're good, to try to trick people into thinking at least that we've been, you know, good all week. And worse yet, if we're not careful, is we can come in here and we can start to have all these actions and all these gestures to try to make God think that we've been good. And yet the reality, friends, is that we're sinners. And so there are plenty of us who have walked in here this morning and we're outside the yellow area. There are plenty of us who have walked in here this morning, we're living the new life, but the old life is creeping in. There are plenty of us who are are living in the light, but we're, we're fighting the darkness while we're here. In fact, look what the Bible says. The Bible says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so what the Bible tells us here is that if we come in here and we play charades, we go through these actions, we go through these gestures, we go through the motions to try to trick everyone else into thinking that we're good, to try to fool everyone else, the Bible says the only one that we're really fooling is ourselves. And so if we find ourselves outside of this yellow area, then we need a cleansing. We need to be purified, each and every one of us. The reality is, some of us sit here this morning and we're outside the yellow area, but the reality is the blood of Jesus can cleanse our hearts, can purify our hearts, because sin is not a superficial problem. And so I think this is the first thing that we need to do. When we blow it, we need to seek a cleansing. Secondly, we also need to be steadfast. I think this is the second thing that we learned from David here in this text, that When we've blown it and we need to be renewed and restored, then we need to be steadfast. Let's go back to verse 10 again. Look at what David says. We're going to work through this together. He says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And so David asks God to renew this steadfast spirit within him. Now, I looked at that word steadfast in the original Old Testament language, and what I discovered is that this is a pretty good translation of this word. I mean, the 
to translate it as steadfast is a pretty good translation, but as you start to dig into the word, you find some of the other kind of minor translations to mean things like to be firmly established, to be fixed, to be securely determined, to be stable. And as you really dig into this word and you get down into like the root of the word, you discover that it, it's a word that really kind of draws this picture that if you're steadfast, then that means that you're loyal. And, and so there's this loyalty in the sense that even when we're outside of this yellow area, on the target, right? So we sin and we're outside of this yellow area. We're going to be steadfast. We're going to be loyal. In other words, we're going to do what we need to do to get back into that yellow area and then try to stay there. So what that means is as we sin, even in our brokenness, we have a desire to be like Jesus. Even in our brokenness, we can grow and be like Jesus. Now, There's a lot of verses in the New Testament that talk about being like Jesus. Talking about Jesus, John says, this is how we know we are in him. So John is about to say, this is how we know that we live this new life, this refreshed life. So he says, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Peter says it like this. He says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Paul says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. After Jesus washes his disciples' feet, look at what Jesus says. He says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Friends, the only way, the only way that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the only way that we can be like him is if we have this steadfast spirit within us. You see, what David is doing here. As he asks God to renew this steadfast spirit in him, what David is doing here is he's repenting. He's repenting. I mean, just think real quick. Just think again of everything that David has done. He sleeps with a married woman. He gets her pregnant. He has her husband come home, tries to cover it up with her husband. When that doesn't work, sends, his hus sends her husband back out on the front lines. He's killed in battle. The baby boy that's born eventually dies. And David's family just falls apart. David realized he needed to come back. David realized that he needed to be renewed and restored in his relationship. He knew that he was outside of the yellow area. But now David's going to let God know that he wants to get back into the yellow area. And the only way that that's really going to happen, the only way that David is really going to live the new life that God has in store for him is if he repents. And so I want to make sure we understand this. Right? Let's talk about this for a second, and then I'm going to move on, and I'll start to close here. When we sin, when we get outside of that yellow area on that target, when we sin, we can ask God for forgiveness. And we should ask God for forgiveness. And God wants to forgive us, right? So when we get outside of that yellow area, when we sin, we can ask for forgiveness. God wants to forgive us. But if that's all we do, if we just ask for forgiveness, then we're going to be forgiven, but then we're going to turn around and we're going to go right back to that sin that got us outside of the yellow area in the first place. And so when we repent, what that means is, is that we're going to go back into the yellow area and then we're going to do everything that we can to stay there. We're going to turn away from that sin and we're going to turn to God. I mean, understand this. When I choose to repent, what that means is I'm choosing to make a U-turn. I'm going to turn from that sin. I'm going to turn back to God. I'm choosing to no longer live my own way, but now I want to live God's way. And I want to live like and look like Jesus as much as I possibly can. I want to be back in that yellow area, and I want to do everything that I can to stay there. Look at what Peter says in Acts chapter 3. He says, repent then and turn to God. So I love how Peter says this, okay? So hear me on this. The whole purpose of repentance, the whole purpose of repentance is to turn from that sin. The whole purpose of repentance is to choose to live God's way and not our own way. To turn from that sin and then turn to God. And so he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And so understand this, friends. The goal of repentance is not to make you feel bad. And the goal of repentance is not to make you feel guilty. The goal of repentance is for you to have a turnaround. 
The goal of repentance is for you to be steadfast and have hope. You see, friends, here's the good news, okay? If you've come in here this morning and you're sitting here and you realize, oh, I'm outside of the yellow area. I've been outside of the yellow area for a long time. The good news is God's waiting for you to come back. And he welcomes you with open arms. The good news is that God is for you. And that all hope is not lost. And so you can have a turnaround this morning. In the midst of blowing it, you can be renewed and restored. You can have a time of refreshing with the Lord right here, right now this morning. And have this steadfast spirit. And so when we blow it, we need to be steadfast. We can turn to God this morning. He welcomes us back with open arms. And then finally, when we blow it, we need to ask for joy. We need to ask for joy. You know, you, you take a look at Psalm 51, and you go back and you look at, at 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 12, and there is really no way that you can sugarcoat what David has done. And there's really no way that you can sugarcoat the consequences that David had to face because of his sin. This baby boy that's born dies, and his family just simply falls apart. I mean, this isn't... I mean, Make no mistake, David really, really blew it. This is an awful situation that David finds himself in. And when you get to verse 12 here in Psalm 51, you understand that David realizes how awful this situation is because look at what he prays. This is what he says, verse 12. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now, I don't know about you, but I just have to feel for David because David ends this section by simply asking God for the joy of his salvation to come back. And so what that tells me is, is that there was a time in his life where David had the joy of God's salvation. He had the joy of God in his life, but because of his sin, he lost it. And now he's begging God, he's pleading for God to have the joy of of his salvation, to have it back in his life again, to have the joy of having God in his life again. So understand this, friends, okay? When you get outside of that yellow area, that, that bullseye that we're supposed to live in, when we sin and we fall short of his expectations and we get outside of that yellow area, you don't lose your salvation. Okay, I want to make sure we understand that. You don't lose your salvation, but it is possible to lose the joy of your salvation. It is possible to lose the joy of having God in your life. Because when you sin, when, when, when you fall outside of that yellow area, when I sin, when I fall outside of that yellow area, there's this wedge now that's driven between God and me and my relationship with him. And if I just continue to compromise, and I continue to compromise, and I continue to compromise, and I continue to live outside of the yellow area, outside of the yellow area, outside of the yellow area, before you know it, there's this distance between God and me, and he just seems far, far away. And so maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've gotten off on the wrong road. Maybe you're sitting here and somewhere along the way you've gotten off on the wrong path. Or maybe you're sitting here and you realize, maybe you don't even realize, maybe you didn't even realize it until a few moments ago, that you've just kind of drifted in your relationship with God. You know, one of, our, uh, one of our favorite places to go as a family on vacations, Gulf Shores, Alabama. We love to go to the beach. We love to swim in the Gulf, so we love to go to Gulf Shores. And whenever we're at Gulf Shores and the kids are out there and they're swimming in the Gulf, we have to keep a close eye on them, you know, for several reasons, but... One of the things that invariably always happens is the, the kids get out there and they get busy swimming and, and they're looking for shells or boogie boarding or, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. But they're out there in the water and the way the current goes is it just kind of pushes them down the beach. And before long, without them even realizing it, they've drifted all the way down from where we are. And so when they get, you know, to a distance that we're uncomfortable with, we have to kind of call out to them, hey, come back this way. We want you close. Come, come, come this way. We want you to be close again. 
Sometimes that happens in our relationship with God. We just kind of start drifting. And maybe we realize it, maybe we don't, but we just kind of drift and we drift and we drift. And the good news this morning is that God calls out to us and he says, Hey, I'm for you. I want you to be close. Come back this way. I want you to have the joy again. I want you to look at what Jesus says. I love this. Jesus says, until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. I love that. Our joy, our complete joy is found in the name of Jesus. And he says, ask and you will receive. And so that's what I want to give you an opportunity to do this morning. Here in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And then when I'm finished praying, I'm just going to give you a few moments to just spend with God. And maybe as you sit here this morning, this is an opportunity for you to just ask and receive. Maybe this morning you ask for a cleansing. Because sin is not a superficial problem, right? It's a heart problem. And so maybe you just ask for the blood of Jesus to cleanse your heart. You ask for the blood of Jesus to just purify your heart. Maybe you just tell God this morning, you know what? I'm done playing games. I'm done playing charades. I'm a sinner. And I need my heart cleansed. I need my heart purified. Or maybe you ask for a steadfast spirit. Maybe this morning you find yourself outside of the yellow area and you realize that you just keep going to whatever that sin is that keeps you outside of that yellow area. And so today you have an opportunity for a turnaround. You have an opportunity to make a U-turn, to turn away from that sin and to turn to God. And so maybe that's what you take the time this morning to do is just ask for the steadfast spirit. Maybe you take some time this morning to ask for joy. You had the joy at one time. You had the joy of his salvation. You had the joy of him being in your life, but somewhere along the way, you've lost that joy. I want you to know that he wants to be close. That he's here this morning with open arms to just welcome you back, to welcome you home. To give you the joy once again. And so I'm going to pray here in just a moment. And then I'm just going to give you an opportunity to just spend a few moments and just tell God what's going on. I mean, he already knows, right? You can't fool him. So just talk with him about it. Now, if you have a sin that just has a grip on your heart and it's just squeezing tighter and tighter because it's not a superficial problem, right? It's a heart problem. And it's just squeezing tighter and tighter. And you need to talk with someone. You need somebody to pray with you. Then here in a few moments when the service is done and people are walking out, be standing right down here down front, please just come and talk with me. I, I'd be happy to pray with you. And please understand, I'm not going to tell anybody anything that you talk to me about. And there's no judgment here, right? We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. But if you need to talk, if you need somebody to pray with you, then please just make your way down front here in a few moments when the service is over. If you're watching online, my email address is on the screen. Send me an email. If you need to talk, if you need somebody to pray with you, and we'll set up a time where we can do that. And so I'm going to pray, and then there's going to be some music that's going to play in the background. We're going to give you a few moments. And then here in just a little bit, Sean's going to come out, and he's going to lead us in a time of communion. So let's pray together, and let's just take some time to just talk with God. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that we can be renewed and restored in this new life that we have in Christ. Father, there's times when we are outside of that yellow area. There's times when we're living this new life and the old life starts to creep in. We're living in the light and we start fighting the darkness. We're living with authenticity. We start to compromise. There's times, Father, we just blow it. 
but it is so good to know and it's so comforting to know this morning that you are here with open arms welcoming us back that you're calling out to us letting us know that you are for us that you want us to be close and so father we take these next few moments and maybe some of us ask some things maybe we ask to be purified and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Maybe we ask for this steadfast spirit that we, in our brokenness, we want to grow and be like Jesus. That we're turning to you this morning for this time of refreshing with you. Maybe we, this morning, Father, may we ask for the joy of your salvation, for the joy of having you in our lives once again. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. We thank you, Father, for knowing that as sinners, all hope is not lost for us. Father, may you renew and restore us this morning. As we just come before you in these next few moments, and we just ask, expecting to receive. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.